Medusa. Above us, wrapped in carpet-thick air, the grand hotel that drugs built. Ice black cars, boys with teeth like sharks, machine guns, dry hills, stray goats, a dead pelican. Below our bodies, folded between the creases of the waves, jellyfish, aguamala, charged with neurotoxins, each sting bringing a flash of blue light, each opening a door. We chill paintings snake across the insides of our eyelids, gods with heads like great pink eggs, triangular stars hammering at the sky, severed fingers, orange jaguars, nameless things that revolve searing us from head to toe. Medusa shakes out her long curls and floats toward us, pulsing and trembling, a magenta globe delicate as a soap bubble. Wrapping her tentacles around our legs, she cradles us in a pain so intense it verges on ecstasy. As we float here, between two deaths, something is burning, something bleeding, something going numb, something going down. <laughs> And uh, I think I'll, I'll give you one more here. Um, which, which one of these shall I give you? Uh, I guess I'll give you one that has, uh, has more of the language in it. Uh, this actually has an epigraph by Christina Rossetti. It's called Obituary for a City that is Still Alive. Um, and it's, uh, the, uh, the epigraph is, it is finished, what is finished, much is finished, known or unknown. Uh, I often have a kind of apocalyptic view of things, and I figure if we're going to write the poetry for what happens in the future, we better write it now. So <laughs> this, is my, this is my attempt at that. Yeah, right. You know, it, it, it'll be too late by the time it actually happens. Okay. It's the small things we'll remember later, not the great buildings stuck in rows like ice trays or the men in black suits swarming the sidewalks like army ants. But a bare maple strung between anticipation and a sky so clear it looks like glass. The sweet taste of chestnuts, the feeling of mashing them against the roof of our mouth. A girl in a red jacket dashing across a playground to kick a blue ball. Three pigeons on a wire. A fruit stand stocked with green grapes. The head of a sunflower spiraling down the gutter. The sound our shoes make on wet concrete. The way our shadows shrink when we turn toward the light. When we close our eyes, we'll see the faces of strangers opening and folding like multicolored fans. And in our ears, which long ago went deaf to hope, we'll hear their voices whispering, nada, ничего, nadinha, nothing. So on that cheery note, uh, <laughs> I'll, move, uh, I'll move into the prose part of the smorgasbord. Um, I'm going to read now from the notorious Mrs. Winston. They have copies here. We'd be overjoyed to sell some copies for them and sign them uh, for you. Um, this is a novel set in the Civil War. It's about a woman who disguises herself as a man to follow first her lover and then uh, to um, uh, it gets swept up in a huge raid, uh, a real raid that very few people know about. It's the longest raid of the Civil War. It's a southern raid by a southern general named John Hunt Morgan. And he raided 1,000 miles into the north after Gettysburg, hoping, hoping to get the north to negotiate. Uh, he raided um, Indiana, Ohio, uh, and Kentucky. And uh, he was almost at the Canadian border. He was only 70 miles from the Canadian border when they caught him. He went in with 3,500 men and came out with 300. Uh, he was captured. It, it's just an incredible story. Dug his way out of prison with spoons, you know, just, and it would have been court-martialed except he became a hero and put, you know, but otherwise they would have shot him because he went against orders to do this. She's not, um, the, the irony of my main character's position, Claire Winston, is that she's an abolitionist caught up with Southern Raiders. And she has developed, uh, you know, she has a lover who's going out of duty, uh, he's not, you know, it, but she's swept along with them, and so she spends a lot of time trying to warn people that this raid is coming um, without getting shot by either side. So she's in a very morally difficult position. Uh, and um, it's based on the stories of, we know that at least probably uh, the proof of about 400 women who fought the Civil War. 
which is interesting because until about 1988, the uh, U.S. government denied any women had ever fought in the Civil War. And then when the, when the records were released, it turns out that all sorts of, you know, um, women were found when they were wounded or sick. Um, a, one woman gave birth, which was a dead giveaway in <laughs> one of the military hospitals. Uh, when they did the burial detail at Gettysburg, they found a woman uh, on the southern side who'd been in the charge, Pickett's charge, and then uh, when um, uh, Clara Barton, the, the, the nurse, went out, she found a soldier who was ill and turned out to be a shot, not ill, dying, turned out to be a woman, and she had recorded this. So this is a very untold history. I find it fascinating now, particularly with women going into combat. Uh, and I had, I've taught creative writing for many years, and my students were beginning to come back, women's students were beginning to come back with stories. So I'm going to read you a little bit of the, of the widow, of the um, uh, the notorious Mrs. Winston, and then I'll give you a little sneak preview of the Widow's War. Um, the first part of the uh, first piece is in Claire's voice. Claire is the main character. Put this on my wanted poster. Claire Winston, nay Musgrove, Boston hostess, murderer, adulteress, horse thief, union spy. And still you'll not find me, for I no longer look like the woman I was only two days ago. Indeed, I don't look like a woman at all. I've stolen the uniform of the corporate Confederate corporal I killed and put it on. The corporal's horse is between my legs, his pistol's in my belt, and I'm riding south to join John, my lover who fights with General Morgan's raiders. And if I'm to be hanged for this, or more likely damned, let me say now, clearly, without reservation, that I'd happily lose my life a hundred times over to see John again. Um, this is a novel about war and obsession, so I thought I'd give you a little of the obsession for starters. And this is the moment when it kind of happens uh, to her. She sees him for the first time in a place where nothing can be heard, said, or even seen clearly thanks to the clatter of the looms and the cotton dust that fills the air. He stands at the far end of the main hall talking to her husband, surrounded by a halo of small particles of lint that twist and revolve around his head like smoke. Although Claire can guess who he is, she can't be sure so for a few minutes longer, he's a complete stranger, this lean, broad-shouldered young man in high boots and a black wool trousers. The jacket he carries casually slung over his shoulder suggests he comes from the Western territories, but it's his hair that stops her in her tracks. In the harsh light that floods through the tall windows, it appears to be a deep red-tinged yellow that glows like ripe wheat. For a moment, she's paralyzed by its beauty. He looks like an angel, she thinks. She instantly tries to correct this impression, but it's stamped on her mind and she can't shake it. A winter spent in Italy listening to her husband rhapsodize over pale, boyish virgins has obviously infected her with a tendency to view people as works of art. Whoever this stranger is, he's certainly no angel. He could easily be a thief, a scoundrel, or worse yet, a slaver who wants to rip the union apart so he can go on trading in human flesh. She should recognize this moment for what it is, the beginning of an obsession, but she doesn't. Later, she will put her finger on the date in her journal and say, it all began here on the 12th of February at this place and this time, just as the war to preserve the Union began nearly two months later to the day. But she is cursed or perhaps blessed with the blindness of all the young women of her generation who cannot see the full fury of the storm that is approaching. Um, she has been helping her father um, take slaves. Um, she lives in Indiana, and Indiana is a free state, and Kentucky's a slave state. And so they've been they're part of the Underground Railroad, and they've been bringing slaves across the uh, Ohio River at night uh, into Indiana. This is very dangerous. Um, there had been a decision that made it legal to drag slaves back out of the North uh, and uh, arrest people that did this kind of thing, so it's a, a big risk for them. Also, they're very likely to get shot doing this. Um, so that's, that's part of her background. I, obviously, in a novel, you can only give people little uh, bits of it. You know, you can't really give them the whole thing. I mean, I could, but I'd have to tie you in your seats and lock the doors and chain them and keep you here till, you know, for several days. And you probably have other plans that uh, don't involve gi giving up your life to listening to a novel read very slowly to you. But um, I want to read you a moment of Morgan's Raiders because I want to talk a little bit. I, I, Morgan's Raiders, well, Morgan was a southerner. He was a slave owner. And he, uh, he and his men did this, this huge raid. Um, they were a very strange group, uh, as you'll hear from this. Um, they didn't uh, 
wear ordinary military uniforms. They went into battle, not only with their slaves, who they took into the north, and guess what the slaves did when they got in the north? You know, they left. Uh, and my favorite is Morgan's va valet, who actually took his wallet and left. <laughs> he actually ran away with his wallet. Um, but they came in with crystal goblets and, and tents and rugs and wine and, you know, just, it was just, it was insane. And um, uh, Mark Twain said that he thought the, the South lost the war because it had read too much Sir Walter Scott. And as, as I read this next piece to you, I just want to say that this historical detail is, bizarrely enough, accurate. This is what these guys really looked like, and it just seems to be way beyond the, the possibilities. She has, she's disguised as a man. If they find out she's a woman, they're going to, sh um, they may not shoot her, but um, they may. She doesn't really know. They might hang her. And she's got to try to pass um, as a soldier. She's been picked up lurking around the camp. So this is the first time she runs into to Morgan and his men. Up ahead is a handsome two-story brick house, its windows ablaze with lights as if a summer cotillion is in progress. A group of men is sitting on the lawn around a campfire, singing sentimental ballads, and someone's playing a fiddle so sadly the tune sends chills down Claire's spine. As she approaches, she's worried that her lie will not be believed, and that Morgan, whom she met two years ago, will recognize her. Yet as the sentry nudges her into the firelight with his rifle barrel, when the singing stops, her first thought is that she's not interrupted a party of Confederate soldiers, but a band of cavaliers who by some inexplicable accident have wandered into the wrong century. Although she's almost certain that all the men staring at her are officers, they're not wearing uniforms or insignias of rank. Instead, they're dressed in tight black or fawn-colored riding pants, long flowing linen coats, knee-high leather boots with outsized spurs, and broad-brimmed felt hats pinned up on the right-hand side with glittering stars, silver crescents, and assorted Masonic symbols. They range in age from a boy who can't be much more than 18 to a man in his mid-30s, and they're all, with a few exceptions, extraordinarily handsome. The centerpiece of the group, the man to all eyes turn, is Morgan himself. The general is at least six feet tall and powerfully built with gray eyes, slightly curly hair, and sandy colored beard. He's by far the most handsome man in the group. Even his hat seems to sit more dashingly on his head. Claire, when he stares at Claire, his eyes burn with an inner fire that makes it impossible for her to look away. It's the gaze of a saint or a fanatic, the look of a man who's living out the best days of his life. Unlike his officers, who perch on logs around the fire, Morgan sits in a chair that's been carried out of the house and placed on the lawn. Upholstered in pale gold brocade, it gives him the appearance of a king lounging on a throne. The others are drinking something, presumably whiskey out of tin cups, but not Claire notes Morgan. A cut glass decanter filled with bourbon rests on a small table to his left. In his hand, he holds a crystal goblet that sends small rainbows of light scudding across his immaculate white shirt front. Morgan has never seen why he should cease to lead the life of a southern gentleman just because he's gone to war. During the weeks to come, Claire will never see him sleep on the ground or take shelter in a tent. He'll stay in private homes like this one or inns whenever possible in the best room in the finest hotel in whatever town they've captured. During the Great Raid, the longest of the war, his men will ride for 36 hours at a time, cross three states, travel for over a thousand miles, and wear out half a dozen horses apiece, while their commander travels in his personal carriage with Glencoe, his war horse, tied behind. When the carriage is captured by federal troops, Morgan will order his boys to steal him another one. Not until the very end will he climb into the saddle, but when he finally does, he'll ride like a demon and outsmart his pursuers at every turn. So that's just a little, a little look at the book. There's a lot more in here. There are obviously battles and, and uh, uh, love affairs gone wrong and some, I think, rather interesting stuff about the rights of women in marriage and divorce in this era, which in a short are almost none. Um, my final thing that I want to do here is give you a sneak preview of the Widow's War. I know I'm throwing two books at you at once. I've never done this before, but forgive me. I'm, I just got these, and you know they're, they're, they're hot in my little hands now. Um, the Widow's War is a technically a Civil War novel, although it takes place just before the Civil War. Uh, Kansas didn't used to always have a reputation for being a calm place. Kansas was pretty wild and woolly from its er in its early history, and it was particularly um, violent uh, during the 1850s. The Civil War actually started in the Kansas Territory. And for seven years before the Civil War officially broke out, there were battles fought between um, pro-slavers and anti-slavers in Kansas. That um, be, the, the, what was at issue was whether or not Kansas would come into the Union as a free state or a slave state. 
And they were holding an election to determine this. And since there was no residency requirement in Kansas, people from the South and people from the North flocked in to vote at the elections, and some flocked out immediately thereafter. And there were very violent conflicts. Um, the town of Lawrence, which was a abolitionist town, brought out whole in pieces, including sawmills and everything else from New England, was besieged by a southern army of some 3,000 men who uh, shot mortars into it and burned it and looted it and captured it. So these were real battles. And there were actually battles between the militia. My main character, Claire Winston, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm, that's the wrong story. <laughs> See? Got it. Uh, my main character, Carrie Vinton, here, um, is. Um, is uh, a widow, uh, as you'll see, because she has shot her husband and <laughs> run off with her lover, uh, which is, you know, probably the, I don't know, is that the most pleasant way to become a widow? I'd have to think that over. Um, but in any event, um, you would have shot him too, believe me. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, there's a, uh, <laughs> yeah, Angus is looking nervous over there. It's okay, honey, it really is. Uh, <laughs> So I want to read you a little, a little piece of this. Um, I think one thing that makes the novel really interesting is that it, it does have, you know, it, it obviously has a, it has a love story in it. She's, she's gone once again to join her lover. Um, but at the same time, um, historically it's very interesting because it's the story of the first African Americans to fight um, in the Civil War, in Civil War battles. And John Brown makes a major appearance in here. And it's an absolutely fascinating chapter of American history that people who really know about the Civil War know about, but I certainly didn't know about it before I started researching it. Just for example, I found out that during this period after Lawrence was attacked and burned and looted, a southern senator, uh, excuse me, a northern senator from Massachusetts made a speech about the crime against Kansas, about this um, a, a raw, you know, obviously illegal attack on the town by slave owners. And a southern um, representative came to the floor of the U.S. Senate with a cane, and in front of the U.S. Senate on the floor of the U.S. Senate almost beat him to death while one of his friends held the U.S. Senate at gunpoint. So this is, uh, the, the senator from Massachusetts did survive. Uh, he served out many more terms uh, through the Civil War and beyond. But this is quite a shocking moment in American history, if you can imagine a US senator being beaten by another member of Congress on the floor of the Senate. So this is the kind of history that boiling up uh, comes as the background to this novel. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of it. I'm going to read you Carrie's introduction, and then I think one more scene. Kansas Territory, September 1856. Nine days ago, I shot my husband. Tomorrow, I'm going to lead a band of escaped slaves into Missouri to free eight women, four men, and three children who were kidnapped by Henry Clark and his band of border ruffians. Actually, the escaped slaves are going to lead me. They were trained in the art of war by John Brown himself, and God help any slaver who gets in our way. When I throw the divining shells and look into the future, I can see that this is only the first battle in a civil war that will soon engulf the entire nation. That war is racing east right now toward New York and Boston, Richmond and Savannah, crackling and roaring like a prairie fire, and there's not a thing any of us can do but prepare to stand and fight. Henry Clark welcomes this war. For the past week, he's been hunting me like game. He's plastered a poster with my description on, one, on the side of every jail in western Missouri. Wanted, white woman, age 25, brown eyes, blonde hair, five foot five in height, approximately 120 pounds, slave stealer, abolitionist, station master on the notorious Lawrence line of the so-called Underground Railroad, goes by the name Carolyn Vinton, Carrie Vinton, Carolyn Sailor, and Mrs. Dinkin Pressgrove. He got most of the details right, but that poster also contains additional information that reads as if it were composed by a madman, which leads me to believe Clark himself wrote it. Armed and dangerous, I take as a compliment, but what am I to make of the charge that I'm known to consort with satanic spirits or kill men from afar by mysterious means? Clark makes it sound as if I'm wanted for witchcraft. I wonder what he'd have written if he'd known I was coming after him with a cavalry unit of black soldiers. So that's her, that's her introduction. Um, there's a, um, the next um, very short paragraph uh, takes place three years earlier in Rio de Janeiro. Carrie is the daughter of a famous American orchid hunter. Um, she has been, spent a lot of her time in the jungles of Brazil and has been raised quite a bit in a quilombo, which is a community of escaped slaves in Brazil. And her grandmother substitute is a woman who has taught her about the African-Brazilian religions of Brazil. 
And so I'm going to give you her moment in Rio de Janeiro, and then I'm going to quickly take you to the Quilombo, and then I'm going to stop. So here we have Rio de Janeiro, October 1853. Their child is conceived in a time of plague. Here is how Carrie remembers it. She and William in her bed in her father's house on the Ladera de Gloria with the shutters closed. Outside, panic in the streets as refugees flee the city. Black flags in the port, ships in quarantine, the sound of church bells to tolling, tolling ceaselessly. Inside, light slanting through the wooden slats of the shutters, the scent of freshly turned earth drifting in from the garden, William's eyes filled with despair, the tenderness and fierceness of his lovemaking, his hair thick and soft as brown silk. Speaking his name, she pulls him closer and tells herself they'll be together for the rest of their lives. That's the moment she first realizes he's burning with fever. And when she sits up, sweating and shaking, she understands she's burning too. She, goes, uh, she wakes up next to the hospital to discover that there's no sign of William. She's afraid he's died in the epidemic. He went out to tend the sick. She goes to the Quilombo, to the community of escaped slaves, and she asks Maseja, the um, uh, priestess of Condomble, to do a ceremony to look for him. And I'm going to very briefly read you this very small moment of ceremony, and then um, that will be the last thing I'll read. The ceremony begins a little after midnight in a clearing about 100 yards from the Quilombo. The moon has set, the stars are hazed by the moist breast of the jungle, and the only light comes from the candles on the altar. Approaching Carrie, Ma Seja's oldest son offers her a gourd filled with black liquid. Drink, he commands. Accepting the gourd, Carrie drinks deeply of something so bitter she gags. Behind her, the candles on the altar flicker, casting shadows that rush over the vine-draped trees like swarms of butterflies. The drumming starts, the ry rhythms enter her chest, and her heart begins to beat in time to the drums. How long does this go on? She has no way of knowing. But at some moment, the men and women of the Quilombo rise to their feet and begin the whirling dance of the gods, the Orishais. They're dressed as gods, holding mirrors and wooden swords, their faces veiled by strings of beads. As they dance, they appear inhumanly beautiful, surrounded by auras of light. Carrie's beginning to get frightened. She wants this to stop, but when she tries to stand, she can't move. She opens her mouth to cry she can't bear anymore, but before she can speak, she hears William's voice. He seems to be sitting directly behind her. For a moment, she's too shocked to put her thoughts in order. Carrie, he says. She starts to turn around, then remembers Ma Seja's forbidden her to do so. This is too cruel. How can she be so close to him and not speak or see his face or tell him she's carrying their child? All at once, she feels something brush the back of her neck, light and quick as a kiss. The drummers find a different rhythm. The candles on the altars flare, and William speaks her name again. She can bear this no longer. William, she cries, where are you, for God's sake? I must know. Are you dead or alive? At the sound of her voice, the drumming stops abruptly, and the dancers freeze in place. There's a sudden silence in the clearing. Carrie shudders and turns around. Masasia is gone. The candles on the altar have been extinguished. She tries to see past the dark altar, but her eyes won't focus. Did she really hear William's voice just now, or did she only imagine it? There's no wind blowing, but when she looks back at the jungle, it's moving in a long, slow wave. What was in that drink they gave her? Papa would have known, or at least he would have asked, but her lips are numb, she can't form words, and all she wants to do now is sleep. Thank you. Thank you.